This is going to be a deep dive into Ukraine's history. I'm on the road, I'm learning a lot about this beautiful country and some history that most sources agree on and some history that some sources don't. I'll take you briefly through the more recent Ukrainian history and then I'll take you through some controversial beliefs by top archaeologists about the ancient past of Ukraine and how this might actually be the breadbasket of Sumerian civilization, which is what most of the world believes is the earliest remnants of modern civilization. Some of these claims, like I said, there are people who hotly contest all of it, but I want to show it to you to see some of the sites that might be erased from history now because of this current conflict that we're in. What we're going to be dealing with today is a deeper understanding of what Ukraine is. You'll come to realize that the actual borders and boundaries of Ukraine is a modern human construction around an otherwise very sporadic history of human populations, but also a very ancient history. And we're going to look back into some of that ancient history. But first, let's start with World War II. World War II was fought over Ukraine, according to Timothy Snyder. I heard Timothy Snyder on the Ezra Klein podcast, and I really like Ezra Klein. I don't need to agree with everybody's politics or their social leanings in order to realize that they're producing harmony in the world. I also really like Timothy Snyder and his points that he brought up. I'm going to share with you some of what he was saying in that podcast. He says that most people look at the modern invasion of Ukraine and think it's primarily about NATO expansion and modern geopolitics. But Timothy Snyder has a different view. Understanding the Eastern Front of Hitler's war rather than the Western Front will paint the Second World War in a very new light. Ancient Greece used to get their grain from Ukraine. In the 16th century, Poland colonized Ukraine during the Age of Discovery and sold their grain around the world for gold and silver, primarily in Latin America. And in the 20th century, Stalin colonized Ukraine, partly because of its fertile soil. Hitler was looking at Ukraine in World War II as his last best opportunity for Germans to create a colonial system like that of other countries at that time. According to Tim Snyder, the Second World War was all about Ukraine in the eyes of Hitler. When you look into the annals of history, you realize there's a thousand years of it around Kiev before any contact between Kiev and Moscow. However, let's go a little deeper into some ancient history of Ukraine that most don't know about. It's still being hotly debated, yes. However, Ukraine's foremost archaeologists like Yuri Shailov and Anatoly Kefishin are the ones that are proposing this theory. Their theories actually go farther back into history. Plus, Anatoly Kefishin is one of the world's most renowned Sumerologists. The main theory that you are going to be seeing in this lecture that I'm about to show you by Tim Hooker at Megalithomania conference in 2009, Tim Hooker is the one translating Yuri Shailov's work because there's not much of it in English speaking websites or books. Let's dive into the video so you can see just a sliver of ancient Ukraine's distant past. Kamyana Mohila is very much to Ukraine what Stonehenge is to, I think, to Britain. It's the oldest known sanctuary observatory in the world, closely associated with Cattle Hayek in Anatolia, uh, and also with Suma, and these are from the times before the Black Sea flood. We know from these petroglyphs that these people called their sanctuary observatory Shunan, and that's the name we use now, and we also know that they called their land Arata. The Dalai Lama has been there, and he clearly felt something very special. Do understand that this is thousands of years before Stonehenge, Sumer, Giza, Indus Valley. It's very much the origin to, un to understanding the origin of civilization. This is a matriarchal society. Male priests came much later. Underneath it, there are so far discovered 62 grottos and caves. And it's in these caves that we find the petroglyphs. <clears throat> you won't find a great deal about this on the, on the internet or in books because very little of it has come, has come into English-speaking Western literature. 
Anatoly Kafishin, the Ukrainian, is almost certainly the world's greatest Sumerian scholar, has recognized that the petroglyphs are in proto-Sumerian writing. And he spent a long, long, long time uh, deciphering these. And it's from his work that I'm going to be telling you much of what we've discovered today. There was initial doubt that these petroglyphs could actually be Paleolithic, but I think the mammoth there says it all. So let's take it a stage further. How do we understand how these petroglyphs are, are interpreted? Kafishin and other people like him have looked at other early scripts, principally from Sumer, Elam, which is old Tur uh, Persia, and they're going back several thousand years BC, Katal Hoyak, 6,000 BC. But it is very clear that there are correspondences between all of those archaic writings, and it clearly seems to point to some central origin geographically, and Shu Nun fits that position. There's evidence here that you're looking at the earliest archive of writing in the world, and I stress, this is 22,000 BC. Here's writing. Those are words, and it translates as this. And straight away you spot Inanna. She's the mother of the blessed country. And Shunan you see as the law of fate or law of destiny. Now, many of you will think, Inanna, she's from Sumer. Yeah, 3000 BC. We've got her here in Arata in Ukraine, 22,000, along with other Sumerian deities, Gatam Dug, Nindar, Utu, Enlil, Anu. They're here in Ukraine long, long before they appear in Sumer. Here's another example of a petroglyph. I'm two meters tall. This thing's two and a half meters wide. It's not a tiny scratching on rock. It's very clear and very deliberate. You've got seven sentences here in proto-Sumerian script. And I'll just take those little words, which translate as this, and <coughs> put that into English. It talks of the Anunnaki have no equal to themselves. Now, I was gobsmacked when I saw this. You, you just think, Anunnaki, Sumer, 3,500 BC, uh-uh, rethink. Arata civilization, 22,000 BC, centered in Ukraine. Now, even if we got the words in the wrong order, you can see here, we're talking about rulers and priests, legal structures, divination by pouring water, capital punishment, concepts of souls and the afterlife, and <laughs> the Sumerian gods, rename them, let me take you further north up the mighty river Dnipro into central Ukraine to Hortitsia. This is a river island, and it's very, very special to the Cossacks. On Hortitsia Island, there is a stone circle which we went to see uh, called Brigania. It's about 5,000 BC. <coughs> there is a sun sighting stone on the periphery labelled A, and <coughs> this site is also of interest, not just because of solar alignments, but Tibetan lamas regularly make pilgrimages to Hortitsi Island because they recognize that this is their origin point, and they have the records to show that. On top of the mounds, they would position Kerhan Steely. These are anthropomorphic statues. Um, you've got them in large numbers all the way across Ukraine, southern Russia, Mongolia, uh, so southern Siberia. And in Ukraine, they're referred to as stone babas or kamyana babas. It comes from the word, the Turkic word, baobao, meaning grandfather or ancestor. But in Ukraine, uh, they're largely all female. Uh, it's a matriarchal society there. Here you see the stone babas positioned on top of the kerghans. And I draw your attention once again to the, the, the stone, uh, the curbstones around some of these uh, kerghans, because we've seen this sort of thing before. We have. Douth. It's virtually identical. Want to see that again? You got it. And look at the big mound behind at Douth, because that is pretty much the same as this one, which is an Etruscan mound that Lee and I went to uh, back in November in Italy. We know that the Etruscans came from uh, the Dniester area of Ukraine. And notice this mound is at Barati. They brought the name with them. This is Arata. Let me introduce you now to another Ukrainian that we've become very friendly with, and this is Dr. Vladimir Krasnoholovitz. He's a theoretical uh, physicist, a senior theoretical physicist at Kiev, and here you see him measuring inerton radiation. This is a kind of Earth energy. It's a revolutionary description of mass derived from the structure of space. I don't mean outer space, I just mean space. How he's done this, I do not understand. But why it's important to you to understand this today is that all matter because it has mass, has this inerton uh, field around it. Now, the mantle rocks under the Earth's crust are a different density. 
So they will have a different inerton field. And where they extrude through channels, mantle channels, up to the Earth's surface, that will alter the inerton field experienced at the Earth's surface. And that is key to what we're looking at here. Because it is detectable, not just by instruments, plants respond to it, and people too. And this has been studied also by the KGB in the 1980s. Russian physicists were exploring this Earth energy. They were particularly interested in perhaps finding ways into military potential of psychological weaponry. Vladimir is developing the inerton theory and taking this into biodiesel production and medical science and food science because it's, it's, it's beneficial. But he's also significantly interested in the archaeology. His friend Yuri Shilov, the archaeologist, having studied thousands, no, hundreds of sites across Ukraine, sees the evidence on the ground that there is an earth field. Now, another geologist in Ukraine, Ferdu, has discovered that mounds and sanctuaries were built on the perimeters of the mantle channels that I've referred to, but particularly on promontories which are intersected by faults. And here you've got a promontory between three rivers, and it is intersected by a fault line, a geological fault line, and it has three mantle channels. Now, the geophysicists know that the energy of mantle channels is strongest on the circumference, not in the center. And surprise, surprise, no surprise, that the Kurhans are built on the periphery of these mantle channels. This is a geologically important area. Everything that's read there is being mined. A lot of uh, sites are disappearing in Ukraine. Now, what you're seeing is the Dnipro area. In the past few weeks, it has been raised to the ground during this current crisis. Much of its modern history is being lost. I wonder how much of its ancient history is being lost. There are many geoenergetic sites that hold possible answers to the origin of the Aryans, Slavs, Baltics, and Russians, and the entire lineage coming from ancient Sumer, if Anatoly Kofishin is correct. And all of it being brought to an end. But let me just remind you what you've seen. Sanctuary observatories on geoenergetic sites with solar alignments and a functional choice of constructional materials of those boundaries. We've got concepts of afterlife and spiritual movement between the worlds. We've got the familiar deities in Arata many, many, many millennia before they appear in Sumer or in the Indus Valley. The stone library itself is impressive enough, 22,000 BC. Uh -uh. Kofishin in his book, published in 2001, says it's 42,000 BC. Ukraine is the homeland of Arata. Arata is the earliest known civilization. Ukraine is on the map. Ukraine is on the map, for sure. So I'm not making any specific statements of my belief in any of this work that's been proposed. But as I started researching Ukraine's history, this video has only 10,000 views. Another one maybe has 50,000 views. And as I'm looking up all these locations on the world map, these are some of the locations that are being demolished. It's hard to find all the site locations, and it's hard to find any information on Google, DuckDuckGo, or any of the other search engines. Trying to find any word of these stone monuments around ancient Ukraine is very difficult. We know during the Iraq war that much of the museums were looted and ancient history was stolen. Where did it go? The public doesn't know. It was just passed off in the papers as looters. And in Anatoly Fomenko's book, The Issue with Russian Tartary, he says, as the museum staff told us in Kiev, Several cartloads of headstones, icons, books, and other artifacts were taken away from the cathedral in the 1930s. Their fate and destination remain a mystery to this day. Now I want to read a little bit of Yuri Shailov's book called Ancient History of Arata, Ukraine, 20,000 BCE to 1000 CE. Since the era of ancient Greece, the population of Eastern Europe had been regarded as uncivilized and barbarous. This biased view was strengthened by Byzantium, which, 
having converted to Christianity in CE 330, reinforced the oppression of pagans via church authority. However, because Eastern Slavs, modern Ukrainians, Belarusians, and Russians accepted Christianity later than other European nations, roughly around 988 CE to 1386 CE, they were allocated the last place in the hierarchy of civilization. Whilst the notorious problem of the Aryans became linked with fascist ideologies, the search for their ancestral homeland actually began in 1820 by the German geographer K. Ritter, who raised the question about the similarity of Indo-Aryans with the Syndics or Hindus of the Kuban area in ancient times. Much later, in 1942, the same position was forwarded by the Austrian linguist P. Kretschmer, who pointed out that the old Syndic after Herodotus was located in the lower reaches of the Borsinthines, River Dnipro. Since then, there have been many international publications which have collectively confirmed the ancestral homeland of Aryans to have been in the Dnipro area. In the 20th to 17th millennia BCE, when the greatest cold period occurred in Europe, a land called Arata, well organized by priests, was formed between the Carpathians and Caucasus, the Volga and the Danube. This was a well-developed region of mammoth hunters, but the subsequent environmental changes that brought about the extinction of those animals also led to the demise of Arata. By the 12th millennium BCE, the last of its wisdom keepers were concentrated in the grottoes of the sanctuary called Stone Grave near Melitopol. There, the last of these hunter-gatherers began cattle raising and primitive agriculture triggering the beginning of the Great Neolithic Revolution. However, the ecological demographic catastrophe of the mid-7th millennium BCE compelled them to drift closer together with the related keepers of Stone Grave, who, having invented a written language, had begun the most ancient sacred texts during that time. Recorded here in writing, in 6200 to 97 BCE is the world's first known agreement about mutual aid. Now think a little bit about modern Ukraine and the mutual aid they're asking for. That event marks the beginning of the state of Arata, and along with it, the beginning of world civilization. The formation of the Vedas was principally associated with Kurhans, burial mounds, the prototype of which was Stone Grave, known then as Kurgal or Kuran. This is an epithet of the creator god Enlil, who was known there from inscriptions of the 8th to the 7th millennia BCE. From him were derived Slavic Lel, Indo-Aryan Lilith, and Jewish Eloi. The most ancient Kurhans appeared in the Ukrainian Dnipro area. Because the historical record of the Veles book and others harks back to 20,000 to 21,000 years, there is a reminder to seek the real ethnogenesis of Slavdom, not only in the most ancient state of Arata, but also in the depths of its previous formation during the times of mammoth hunters. So that's as much as I'm going to share with you right now, even though there's so much more history that we could get into. I'd like simply to share with you this Instagram post by Nassim Harriman. It shows this six-pointed star that many see as the Star of David actually shows up in Armenian, Ethiopian, Roman, Phoenician, Hindu, Mesopotamian, Bactrian, Egyptian, and Japanese historical scripts. The interesting part I'll note is this Bactrian one. The Bactria Margiana archaeological site in present-day Uzbekistan, was uncovered by Viktor Saryanidi in the 70s. In this location, they found a factory to produce some kind of beverage that had cannabis sativa, ephedra, from which is derived methamphetamines, and poppy, from which we get opium and other opiates. And this beverage was shipped along the Silk Road, it seems. And it was around 4,000 years ago that it was attacked and abandoned, never to be touched again, until the 70s. I bring this up to show that Heather Lee Hooker, Tim Hooker's wife, speaks about 
the practices that were being done in Ukraine, connecting with this inerton field under the earth and actually creating some kind of altered effect, potentially using cannabis sativa as well to tune into the inerton field. Now, this is all speculation and it all could sound a little too new age, but if you're willing to open up your mind and just consider that the practices of the ancient world and what we would call modern magic are two completely different things. Ancient magic may have been far more connected to collective practice and, let's say, a collective placebo effect. I do believe that if we find harmony from people from diverse backgrounds, affiliations, beliefs, ideologies, when we focus on their ideology too much and what we dislike about them, we miss the opportunity to be in the human band. We can make some sacrifices to the way that we live and the way others live in the face of creating harmony, creating beautiful music. And I do believe that the ancient past using dance, music, and the arts to commemorate, have reverence for, and give love and worship back to that mystery that creates all of us, then I do believe we can have a state of global healing, mourning for what is being lost, and a celebration for what is coming and what is being born, because the world is changing. So that's as much as I'm going to give to you here. You can expect the rest on the deeper dive over at benjosephstewart.com, where you can get all that exclusive content. And I hope you appreciated this faceless waking infinity.